that level of warming already, in the last decade, we've had more than a 100% increase in extreme weather events. The science only can tell us that as we warm more, it's going to get much worse. But they cannot tell us if we move from 1.1 to 1.3, say, it's going to quadruple, it's going to be 10 times worse than it is now, but it's going to get much worse. Now, those of you who watch television news periodically, uh, I want to just ask you to just stop and think for a minute. Don't you think that these days, in the last five years, when you switch on the TV and watch news, that even as a person who might not be following it, that we see significantly more extreme weather events that are happening all the time? Which brings us to the second biggest challenge that we face. And, and climate change and the economy are two of the biggest injustices and challenges that we have to face. And both of them have one very powerful thing in common. And that is those with power speak about finance issues and climate change issues in a way to lock out 99.99% .99 of the people from the conversation. So let me just say to you in a very gentle way, right? And it's not your fault that uh, you don't know. Because I'll tell you honestly, when I watch like, you know, the financial indicators every day in the news, I like have to, you know, I'm not an economist, and I have to like really scratch my head to make sure that I'm understanding exactly what that is. And I'm somebody who's had the privilege of an education, right? So when we look at the question of inequality in the world today, it is crazy. You know, you've got 85 people in the world who amass more wealth than 65% of the people in the bottom parts of the world. So now we're going to play a little game. And I'm going to use a website called, does you see it? Yeah, Global Rich List. So let me ask you, yeah, how many of you, if somebody asked you, are you wealthy, would say, yes, I'm wealthy? About one third. OK. So I'm going to ask you a personal question now, right? How many of you earn more than 15,000 pounds per annum, roughly? Per year. Net, net eh? after tax. <laughs> OK. So most people yeah, earn more than 15,000. I'm not going to ask you exactly what you earn. But let's take 15,000 as, OK, can I just check? You can cough for this answer so you don't. Uh, <laughs> How many of you are close to 15,000 a year? OK. OK, so we're using 15,000. So now, there are about 7.4 billion people in the world, right? This website, when I press show my results, is going to tell us if you're earning 15,000 pounds a year net, where you fit in the salaries in the world, OK? Now, before I press the answer, I want to ask, how many of you think that this salary will be in the top 50% in the world? Please raise your hands. 50. 50. 50. 0 OK, how many of you think it's in the top 20% of the world? OK, how many of you think it's top 10% of the world? Whoa, OK. How many of you think it might even be in the top 5% of the world? OK, let's see. OK. It was close to 3%, I thought you said that. For, for, so that means if you're earning 15,000 pounds a year, you are the 244th million wealthiest person in the world. That means there's like. Six plus billion people, you are doing so much better than. So, just to put it in context, what that means with that salary, just to give you a few examples, in, if you were earning 15,000 a year, a factory worker in Ethiopia can make just 0 0.15 pence in the same time. It takes just a minute to do something to help, though by getting involved, okay? So 
the reason I share this with you is because we have to begin to question the multiple levels of inequality that happen around the world and also to begin to question our own patterns of consumption. Right? So when I was at Greenpeace, for example, people, because Greenpeace prided itself as it correctly should do, as Amnesty International does, of not taking any money from government and business, that all the money is raised from individual citizens. And on my first month on the job, I had a very feisty journalist from Finland saying, so Mr. Naidu, how do you cope with the contradiction that in fact, the people that are able to fund Greenpeace are largely the over-consumers of the world? The very fact that they have excessive income is because they have reached you know, a certain level of consumption. So I would argue, looking at the conversation we had in the plenary after lunch, when we look at what's on the table to address the two biggest challenges that we face, which is climate and dealing with an unjust economic system, we got the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, which we heard about. Now, I want to just take a few minutes to say a few things about the SDGs. But first, I want to say something about the MDGs. So you know when the MDGs first, the Millennium Development Goals, when they were adopted in 2000, many of us in civil society did not embrace it because we saw them as MDGs, minimalist development goals. Because if you looked at what was committed on gender at the Beijing conference in 2005 and what was in the MDGs on gender equality, it was reduced to a few little indicators. There were many other problems with the MDGs because goal one to goal six, the responsibilities of develop, developing countries, or so called developing countries, and for that you had benchmarks, targets, deadlines. Goal seven was about the environment, which was supposed to be shared between North and South, and goal eight, which was on a partnership for development on trade, aid, technology transfer, which is the responsibility of rich countries. So goals seven and eight had no benchmarks, no targets, no pressure. Right? So between 2000 and 2004, there was almost no civil society mobilization around it, or passionate civil society. So then eventually, I was then the head of Civicus, and watching what happened to the world after September 11th and the shift to the right and so on, we had a conference in Geneva and an activist from Latin America, Roberto Bussio from Social Watch, said, you know, when the MDGs first came out, we never really embraced it, but now in the current context, you know, post 9-11 and the so-called war on terrorism and so on, he said, in the current context, 2004, um, the MDGs reads like a revolutionary document, right? And I would argue right now, the SDGs for me is not a revolutionary document at all under normal uh, this thing, but only because of the rise of, oh dear, what did I do? <laughs> and when we look at the current growth of right-wing nationalism and fundamentalisms, uh, whether it's Brexit, whether it's Marie Le Pen, whether it's uh, Donald Trump, and many, many other expressions, including a country that I lived in, Netherlands. Uh, what's his name again? Wilders. Oh, that's a very Dutch accent. <laughs> the country that I come from, India, they're also growing. Of course. That's why I said fundamentalisms. Huh? Because we have Hindu fundamentalism, we have Jewish fundamentalism, we have uh, you know, a lot of religious-based fundamentalisms as well. But to compound matters, while all of this is happening, what we see is a shrinking of democratic space. So in many countries around the world today, we have elections without democracy. I would argue we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. If you look at the Brexit result here, and you look at within 24 hours of the result, your current foreign minister blatantly said, of course I lied about, I mean he didn't quite say that, but he acknowledged that he lied about that, what was that figure, 400 million a week to the NHS or something like that. Okay. 
So, but there's no accountability, right? But when you look at how elections have evolved, they have become what Rajesh Tandon from India and myself warned in a 1999 book called Civil Society at the Millennium, where we said, if we do not ensure that there's integrity and meaningfulness in election processes, elections will become nothing more than an elite legitimation exercise, right? And sadly, we see that happening. And the three most important freedoms for activism is the freedom of assembly, the freedom of expression, and the freedom of association. And all of these three are severely, severely uh, challenged. Our colleague from Civicus, who's not in the session, I think, he will tell you that Civicus was tracking this. They are showing that at any given time over the last couple of years, we've had about 40 to 60 countries where there have been systematic attempts at shrinking democratic space. But with all of this happening, what we have from those with power is a really serious case of cognitive dissonance, right? I thought since I'm at a university, I should use some big words. Eh? <laughs> so for those of you, though, who did not attend the psychology class or the political science class where such terms are taught, I want to give you, you know, cognitive dissonance is very simple to understand. I'll give you a story. You remember that moment when the US troops finally made it into Baghdad and Saddam Hussein's communications minister was still there. You remember he was doing press conferences? Okay, younger people might not remember. <laughs> and he was saying, so they asked him, how are you going to withstand, you know, American and British power, military? And he was like, how long do you think you'll last? And he said, last? What do you mean? We are in control. Everything is fine. There's nothing happening. And behind him, there are buildings burning, bombs are dropping. <laughs> in the press conference, you can see the smoke rising, and everything was fine. That is how our leaders are reacting to the reality, to the fact that right now, if we look at the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement, Donald Trump, God bless his soul, he actually popularized it by pulling out of it. But actually, if you go read, if you go read the Paris Agreement, let me say to you, the Paris Agreement simply gave humanity a chance to live to fight another day. Okay. Um, Psychology has a word that is probably sorry. used more than any. So I want to quickly transition to the frame of what I think is necessary to happen in the world right now, where we have to challenge lots of orthodoxies that we've actually, even as progressives, embraced. And I'm going to draw on Martin Luther King to help me with that. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. It is the ringing pride of modern child psychology. Maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live a well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. As I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, and there are some things in our society and some things in our world which I am proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. I just repeat, I last very much. I refuse to adjust to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. He was talking about the United States in 1965. That quotation has become significantly more relevant to the United States, but has also become even more 
relevant to the rest of the world. So the question for us then is how do we address these issues and effect deep transformational change in the face of current political, social and, e and economic crisis? How do we combat the biggest disease in the world? I'll tell you what that disease is in a second. Anybody knows? Affluenza. Affluenza. How do we adjust ourselves to the status quo even that even those in the progressive movement have fallen victim to? And when I say progressive movement, I mean progressive academics, progressive people in NGOs and so on, because if you look at that calculation, many of the leadership of, say, the international NGO community, which I was part of, are much closer to the 1% than they are to the 99% in whose names they serve. And that contradiction must be talked about in an honest and open way. And unless we address that question of terribly unequal compensations, we will never be addressed the issue of inequality. We have to ask the question, how was it that in 30 years, the gap went like this? We know the reasons. Reagan, Thatcher, the economic policies, and, 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 and so on. You know, different moments, you see different spikes, uh, spikes in, in, in uh, but part of the problem for activism and I'm going to be very personal now. By the way, any criticism that I am sharing is a self-criticism because I've been part of everything. And I want to say to you that I'm going to give you a definition of insanity now that I am 100% fitting that definition. And this is what it is. Oops. He's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. Honestly, if I look at my life and I challenge you, and I challenge anybody who sees themselves as a progressive trade unionist, as a progressive NGO person or a social movement person, ask yourself the question, aren't you been doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results? I've been an activist from the age of 15 and I've largely followed in good faith, in good faith. And the challenge for all of us right now has to be a, converse, a conference on transformation of our world and our society must address the difficult question of what do we need to do differently so that we can win faster and win bigger because if we are brutally honest, we are losing left, right and center with episodic victories here and there. But right now, the balance of forces, especially with the current administration in Washington, has shifted things significantly to the right. So affluenza is what we have to address. We have to have a bigger conversation of how we connect the mind, the heart, and the soul. We have lost our sense of humanity to a large extent. And if you want to put it simply, affluenza is a disease where enough is never enough. Right? The more you get, the more you want. And don't make a mistake about thinking that this is only a sickness that affects wealthy people. This is a sickness that affects poor people just as well because they have been led through a media environment right, to believe that, in fact, happiness comes from more and more and more acquisition of physical things. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but suffice to say, you can find this in the book, uh, Boiling Point, Can Citizen Action Change the World? And the problem we have is most of our interventions are going at the level of delivery of projects and programs, not enough on policy change, and certainly not enough on governance changes. Right? Partly because of the funding trap that I would argue that progressives as well as others are caught in. Right? There is, put it quite bluntly, you can get money now for SDGs. If you do a, uh, a proposal and say, I'm going to advocate for the SDGs, it's one of the easiest things that bilateral agencies and UN agencies are going to fund. Even if you have fundamental problems with whether the SDGs is a package, whether it's contradictory and so on. So I urge you to look at this when you get a chance. So I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but, but I just want to ask you the question. How many of you think the rule of law is a good thing? 
Okay. So those of you who thought that, in the interest of time, you stay behind. I'm going to show you this video of Matt Damon. <laughs> Matt Damon. Uh, 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 maybe in the question time, right? But, but so I want to move quickly to conclude. So I want to say that understanding the role that all of us play as part of the problem is part of the solution, but it is only the first step. I think it is dishonest politically and morally for those of us who have a certain level of privilege not to recognize that privilege. So let me say to you that if you can open a tap and get water, you are doing pretty good. If you can have a shower three times a week, you're doing really good. If you have sanitation, you're doing really good. And sanitation, by the way, is simply a middle class bourgeois way of saying, do you have a decent place to piss and shit? I, 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 I'm not just trying to get the, you know, if they are bleeping there, to get a bleep. <laughs> but it's to make the uncomfortable point that sometimes those of us who reach a certain class position talk about things that affect poor people in a very class biased way. Right? It's easy to say sanitation is such a problem, we all should do things. It's a very nice way to have a conversation. But when you're having the conversation, you must imagine that there are women and men and children who do not have access to what should be a basic human right. So bold systemic change requires courage and tenacity to challenge immoral conventions and orthodoxies. We need to change the narrative. We need to mobilize principle, courageous resistance to the status quo. We need to understand that solutions are not going to come from the current bunch of leaders. Solutions are going to have to come from new thinking. And I want to say to the young people in the audience, how many of you are under 35 here? I'm going to say to you as young people in the audience, you will hear adult leaders saying young people are the leaders of tomorrow. I urge you to resist that. If you wait for tomorrow, there might not be a tomorrow for you to take leadership. The current generation of adult leaders have run out of fresh ideas. They are simply repackaging old ideas. We need absolutely fresh thinking, and it's not going to come from people like myself who meet the definition of Albert Einstein on what is insanity. And, and those of us who have been around must have the humility and the honesty to actually also make way and space for others to emerge. So with those words, I want to conclude with a small story. And the story is a true story, but it's sad. Focus on the motivational part of the story, not on the sadness of the story. Right? <laughs> so when I was 22 years old, I was fleeing South Africa into exile. My best friend at that time, a guy called Lenny, asked me, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution one can make to the cause of humanity? I said, that's an easy question. It's giving your life. And he said, you mean going, participating in the demonstration, getting shot and killed, and becoming a martyr, which was what was happening you know, on a weekly basis in South Africa in the 80s. At every other weekend, we were at funerals burying people that had been killed by the apartheid regime, with the support of many of the countries who claimed to be promoters of democracy, might I add. And, and so he said, so I said, yeah. He said, no, it's not giving your life. It's giving the rest of your life. I was 22 years old at that time. My friend Lenny was way ahead of us. He was the first environmentalist I know. He was the most brilliant amongst us. And importantly, I think at that time, he probably was only one of 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. <laughs> so anyway, we give each other hugs, and we go in different direction. Two years later, while I'm a st student in exile at Oxford University, I get a call that my friend Lenny and three young women from my home city, Durban, were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies, the parents couldn't even recognize them at the mortuary. So I had to think deeply about what he was trying to say in making this distinction between giving your life versus giving the rest of your life. What he was saying was very profound. He was saying the struggle for justice is a marathon and not a sprint. And those of us who've had the luxury and the possibility to understand that there's injustice in the world and that humanity and those of us who have that understanding have a moral obligation to stand up against that injustice and push for a more sane, more just, and more equitable and sustainable world, 
have a responsibility to keep going. So if Robert Mugabe died five years after Zimbabwe got, became president, uh, uh, independent, we probably, history would probably remember Robert Mugabe as a pretty good historical figure. Uh, that's contested as well, but, but, you know, on balance. Today, you know, apart from a few people who have been particularly pushed in a particular way with, re, with the clientelism and so on, the guy is still there doing something very different. Not dissimilar to my beloved president, Jacob Zuma, either in South Africa. And Jacob Zuma and him, you know, uh, in fact, there's a nice meme of Jacob Zuma and uh, Robert Mugabe, where Mugabe is saying, I will resign. Mugabe says, I will die when Jacob Zuma resigns. And Jacob Zuma says, I will resign when, when you know, Robert Mugabe dies. So I want to say to you then that story, why I said focus on the motivational side. Each of us, my dear brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not, because of knowledge, I have an obligation to ensure that we use all our energy to the best we can to work as hard as possible, to exhibit as much courage, to try and create a much better just world. We should refuse to accept that the best that humanity can do on a global basis is to create this level of inequality, this level of insecurity, and this level of injustice. So if you are anything like me, there are many days when you're going to wake up and you're going to question whether your work has meaning, whether in fact spending so much time on a particular project which is very difficult to do, does it really add up and so on. And my appeal in closing to you is when you hit those moments, like you should hit those moments, having those doubts mean that you're a thinking, thoughtful, critical person with a critical mind. If you're not feeling those things, there's something wrong with you. Honestly, there's something really wrong with you if you are not anxious about the state of the world we're in right now. And I want to say when you hit those moments, just think about how more pessimistic the world would, world would be were it not for people like each and every one of you that are willing to stretch the boundaries of analysis, to generate new narratives, to put forward more propositional thinking about a more just economic system, social system, environmental sustainability approaches and so on. So please, when you hit those moments, you have an obligation to rise above it very quickly, right? Because time is against us as it is at this moment because I've been given some notices saying I have to shut up. <laughs> Thank you. We've got two ways to channel your questions, is that there's a couple of mics, and so if you want a mic, give me a wave and we'll get a mic to you, and we'll gather two or three questions together and sort of address them together. If you're shyer, you can always send a, a question via Twitter, and it will miraculously appear here, I'm, I'm reliably told. Um, <laughs> it's as far as it goes. So the first mic, up here, keep on waving. Second mic, over here. Okay, well, while the mics are going around, I just would say that the promise I made, I'm going to stick to it. And if you want to stay behind to see Matt Damon afterwards, <laughs> we can do that. But right now, let's go with the questions. The first question. Hi, I'm Deborah O'Connell from Australia. The closing comments and stories that you made were very close to my heart. I grew up in Zimbabwe with my family fighting on different sides of the civil war. And my uncle was uh, in the MDC, Changarai's right-hand man. He spent his life as a, a, a revolutionary and then uh, fighting on the other side of the war from his whole family and tried his hardest for most of his life to influence the direction of Zimbabwe and participate in the democracy in a way which influenced change after 
Changarai had his many car accidents which were constructed and my uncle had several near misses, he ended up a very uh, disillusioned man now living in exile again in, in Ireland. And I guess for my whole life I've been watching that play out of how do you stay within the system enough to influence change and maintain your sanity while at the same time uh, surviving to, to be able to... St so there's that fine balance between staying within the system within which you can be an instrument of change uh, or not surviving, whether that's losing your job by becoming a science advocate when that's not permitted by your organisation or whether it's in an extreme case like perhaps you've had or my, my family history shows. Thank you, Deborah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm Charles Tanoya. I'm a researcher with the African Center for Technology Studies. I'm working under the. I'm um, Mr. Charles Tanui. Charles. Yes, I'm working with the African uh, Center for Technology Studies under the Africa Sustainability Hub, part of the Global Consortium, uh, the hub based at the Step Center. And um, we had a meeting actually last month in Morocco. We were focusing on South-South collaboration. And I want to ask you, especially the capacity building component under the Paris Agreement, will you find that uh, the civil society are investing more on capacity building and creating masses, especially researchers from Africa, or they are more kind of focusing on criticizing what the government is doing? because we are representing the Sub-Saharan Africa under the International Network on Climate Change Competence Centers and, uh, and think tanks. And, and we found out actually that there is a lot of resources under the Paris Agreement that goes for capacity building. When you engage with individuals, the way you are quite informed, you have traveled, you have done a lot of work, we have published, but if you look at the number of civil society representatives, they are not consistent in following up both the local and the international. And what is the contribution, what is the positive energy they are kind of setting aside to support the government initiative so that we can off that kind of actually entertain that kind of conflict. Thank you, Charles. Do you want to take those two together or add another one to it? Add another one. Add, we'll add one, one more the and yeah. then we'll bring them together. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Kumi. I'm Jessica. I'm from KwaZulu Natal. It's lovely to have you here. Hi. Um, my question is a very personal one, and it's a conversation that I had with James yesterday. It's sometimes hard to live in a place like South Africa where you're faced, I feel I'm faced daily with these challenges very much in my face. And we think about the sort of comfort and convenience of running away from that kind of thing. And on the other hand, the challenge of working with it and becoming a change agent. And sometimes the challenge of becoming a change agent is just too much to bear. And so I said to James, one of my coping mechanisms is to kind of withdraw a little bit and just decide to try and be the best person I can be every day. And that's all I can be. And I just wonder if um, that's kind of a strategy that you've ever considered or what your comment would be on that. Is that enough? <laughs> Not that you know the answer, but I'd like to know what you think about that. Thank you, Jess. So if you don't mind, I'll be biased and start with my sister from my <laughs> home uh, region. Uh, so this is why I ended with that story about Lenny. Because, see, the most difficult thing for us as individual human beings is how do we have the capacity to speak truth to power. And what I mean by that is saying things that are unpopular, right? And standing up in the face of potential uh, repercussions. So, you know, for me, I, I was uh, in the ANC underground and so on as a young person, right? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was the civil society speaker at the rally outside of parliament when parliament was going to vote against, uh, you know, for President Zuma to leave. And you cannot imagine how emotionally challenging it was for me. It's like, you know, in those days, in being in Mandela's movement and all, it was like being part of a religion. Like, you know, you, the, 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 the kind of affinity you had, the levels of commitment you were prepared to make and so on. And it's like this movement that you built, you gave your life for, suddenly gets captured by people who should have known better and so on. So what I think is really important is to budget for disappointment, 
right? Budget for disappointment. Do not expect too much because you're going to be disappointed. But build around you people who can support you in those moments of crisis. Because I can tell you, as an individual, throughout my life, I would have committed suicide 25 times by now if I didn't have people to help me and say, you know, it's okay for me. You know, we, uh, like when Lenny was murdered, I was in the privilege of Oxford University. It was the most hardest thing for me to deal with, right? And I would never have made it back home in one piece, emotionally, I'm talking psychologically, were it not for people who shared my values. And the good thing, Jess, is today as we sit in the world, there is an explosion of numbers of people who are saying, this is wrong, right? Humanity cannot say to itself, the kind of world we have is the best we can create. And so I think it's about building support around yourself. It's about looking at history and see what we can learn from history. And if history teaches us one thing, that when we faced a major injustice or a major challenge, those struggles only went forward, my dear brothers and sisters, when decent men and women stood up and said, enough is enough and no more. We prepare to go to prison if necessary. We prepare to put our lives on the line if necessary. And I want to suggest to you that the reality of climate change means that it's more bigger an issue than all the other struggles we have faced over time. Because if you take gender inequality, for example, it's pathetic that after so many years of gender equality activism, we have the levels of gender inequality in the world. However, with gender inequality, there isn't a clock that's ticking, you know? It's pathetic that we've not got where we should be, but it's not like we have to solve it in the next couple of years and we're running out of time. But climate change puts a completely new reality there. And for those of you who will reach moments where you think actually it's over, when you look at the science and so on, you, you could easily come to a conclusion that says, the best that humanity can be, and I heard this from a climate scientist who told me, Kumi, don't say it publicly. Okay, sorry, uncle. Uh, he said, don't say it uh, publicly, but the, as far as I'm concerned, that what's on the table after Paris means that the best that humanity can do is to be as nice to each other as we, as compassionate to each other as we disappear as a species. By the way, we saw an element of that in Houston recently. I mean, in fact, the one very powerful thing for me to come out of Houston was the sense of how the state actually failed. I mean, not with saying Trump's visit there and all, the state failed, right? Largely failed. If it wasn't for those individual acts of solidarity, many people would have died. But in any case, so hang in there, and I'll just conclude by <laughs> on that one by saying, listen, one thing you've got to communicate to people is that activism is sexy, man. <laughs> really. When I speak to young people, I say to them, you know what? You've got to see activism as fun, right? No, seriously. If we're going to get through this, we have to have a sense of humor. We have to have a sense of kind of community around the people that we, we have to love the people that we're involved with. But what I'm going to say next is going to surprise you. And we have to love the people that we disagree with even more. I love the people that voted for Donald Trump. I don't hate them. I want to understand why they voted, the insecurities and so on, which led them to vote. If we don't understand that as activists, then we are lazy activists. If we think that we're going to move forward by simply talking to the people that think like us and are from the same thing, then we are just preaching to the converted. That's lazy activism. The real activism is going into context where people disagree with you, where you're willing to listen you was willing to hear people tell you you're a bunch of, you're a complete idiot, you are crazy, you are romantic, you are unrealistic. You must be willing to take all of that. And that's the kind of activism we're going to need if we're going to stand a chance to succeed. Deborah, uh, your question, and yours is more comment, but this whole question of staying out of the system and going into it, there's never a right answer to that you know, about where you put your energies because it's always contextual and context is always fluid and changing. But I would say on balance though, um, I think it's critically important for us to now recognize that most of our informal institutions, 
government, UN system, and so on are largely broken, and that if you have the luxury to stay out of the system and, and, uh, and, and organize and try and push from the outside, a choice that I have made, I think that that's a better option. Having said that, we need good people in those institutions. So we should, it's a bit of a contradiction what I'm saying, right? But for me personally, if I thought I could go into any institution and make a difference, then I would, right? But right now, going into any existing formal institution means defending the status quo. And therefore, I think having, and let me be blunt about it, universities are part of the status quo. Right? Look at the universities, what has happened to our universities over the last 30 years. Our universities have been so heavily corporatized. Right? If you look at who's putting money into research departments, there are many universities in the United States that are doing sort of military research and so on because some military company came and gave them a big grant. Right? So what I'm saying is that it's really difficult to find spaces where you can actually operate in, but don't assume that the only way you can have influence is being in formal power and in formal institutions. And Charles, on the capacity development investments, let me answer it this way. Firstly, I would say, okay, please bear with me. I have a little bit of a violent response in a passive resistance way uh, to the term capacity development. Because I really believe that it's not a question of capacity development, it's about creating enabling environments where people's capacities can be released, right? Uh, and what kind of investment we make in our people are different. So the movement that I've put most of my energies in the last year is called Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity. I invite you to, if you're from Africa, to join. Uh, and uh, you can see the Kilimanjaro Declaration there. But We've just had an activist in residence program which is just finishing in the next couple of days in, in Tanzania with activists from across the continent and it's so interesting. They designed it from 14 countries and they're not talking about the normal, you know, like how many of you know what log frame is? Please raise your hand. Okay, now you might have thought that you are, you know, I also did the log frame training Logical framework approach. It's simply a planning method. Something that was a planning method suddenly was made into a biblical edict by donor agencies. Right? And now you've got a whole bunch of people in Africa and in Asia and so on running around. No, I know log frame, I know log frame, I can get my matrices right and so on. But has that enhanced our capacity? <laughs> that has not enhanced our capacity. And so what kind of capacity we need? Because let's be blunt about it. Even within civil society, there is inequality, right? And don't think that if you are in a country like the United Kingdom and you have NGOs here, some really good and strong ones, but you are compl completely contaminated by the reality of British politics and about the aid system and et cetera, et cetera, right? So what you have is delegated conditionality. So UK government says to UK NGOs, these are the conditions which we give you, and then those NGOs come to us and say, you are our partners. They call us partners, by the way. It's so lovely. Uh, so our partners, and then they impose the same conditionalities on us. So, so let me just put it in a bit of a provocative way to conclude this answer. Jay Naidu was the leader of the trade union movement. Same surname, no relation. Uh, but a close comrade. He was speaking at the Clinton Global Initiative in New York, and I just happened to be in the audience. And then a very well-meaning young woman in the mid-30s. It's amazing how what you call young changes as you get older. <laughs> uh, said, she put up her hand and said, you know, I really want to, and she was well-meaning, she was well-meaning. She said, you know, I really want to empower the women of Africa and how can I, you know, empower the women of Africa? And on the panel was also Selif Johnson, Ellen Selif Johnson, the first woman to be elected, you know, head of state in, in Liberia. And Jay's response was, you know, the best thing you can do is get your government to do the right thing. Right? If they say they support democracy, get them to live democracy. Right? Not to say that the people of Palestine must vote and then when the election goes the wrong way, then they say, no, we're against that uh, result. Okay? Some of you might remember. So, so essentially he said, 
what are you? And he said, don't put yourself under the pressure that you're going to go empower them. These are women who are surviving on virtually nothing. And you're going to empower them? <laughs> They're able to get water under the most extreme circumstances. You're going to empower them? No, no, no. Focus on your government. Get your government to have the right trade policies, the right climate policies, and, and so on. So when we're thinking about our capacity development, I think people in the developing world, if I can say this quite strongly, must revisit what kind of content we need in terms of knowledge inputs. And we need to start also generating those inputs because, quite frankly, there are far too people from the global south that have the luxury to write and to tell their stories, and we need to do that. Thanks. Now, I'm going to beg your patience for just another five minutes because there is one hand in the audience that I want to make sure gets a voice, and I know that you've got a couple of things in there that you might be able to draw together. Yeah. So, last question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, and I do it Sadiani, and every line that you said, I agree to what you have said. But I have a serious question, which I will put into two parts in the single question. The one is that the biggest tremor of the world which ever faced is an economic crisis. The biggest tremor, which everybody feels trembling. Not even the nine-point earthquake of Chile can make everybody trembling, but 2008 economic crisis make everybody trembling. With that reality, the new economic regimes or economic system is more comfortable with the authoritarian regimes, whether it is United States to China to India. The more authoritative they are, more bigger support or stronger support they get from their corporate who are financing not only the election but the government. In that situation, the, our strive towards sustainability, primarily <coughs> keeping equality in mind, I see a complete hopelessness and that's why I'm asking this question, where you see the world moving specifically because they have no answer for the unemployment, they have no answer and there is no effort for environment and sustainability because more consumption cannot bring sustainability. There is no systematic even thought to contain the consumption in near future because production has to increase because then only the economy will run. Where you see the world going? Because I see going to a new crisis, and I can't say that which crisis. Because if the people are unemployed, they will be on the street doing all sorts of things, whether in the United States or though in India, the fundamental is going to rise. What kind of sustainability you see in the future? Your good name? I'm Bikram Aditi. Bikram. I teach in India, in Jawahana Nehru University. OK, good to meet you. Thank you. Um, see, another way to look at it, Maybe for the top 10%, let's say, you know, using that global rich list, the top 10% are doing okay. But, but, you know, for many of the people, they are living in a crisis every day. And I can tell you, I'm working with some <coughs> of the community, I know what I'm talking about, you know. When I look at just how they can survive and, and so on. So, so the, the crisis for ordinary people who are not employed, who are underemployed, who are largely rural-based quite often, and the urban poor in informal settlements, they're leading every day is a horrific reality, actually. But the amazing thing that I find, which does ask us to think about affluenza, I can tell you something, eh? people who have lesser money and lesser material possessions overwhelmingly are happier people in other terms. I'm not sure. No. Right? Yeah, I, okay. But I would say that if I look at, even in the communities where I grew up, right, where people, even, even within an apartheid context, that the most generous people were actually the poorest when you went and knocked on doors, you know. If you went to middle class home, they'll never offer you a cup of tea. I'm talking about like upper middle class. If you went to the poor people, they will offer you a cup of tea, and then they'll say, you know what, do you take sugar? I say, yeah. And they say, okay, wait. And they send the child to the neighbor to borrow, you know, six, the equivalent of six sugars. Not that I have six sugars, but uh, not, <laughs> not much less than that. Uh, so, so I think where the crisis is gonna go right now, you know, if, I have to be honest and say that I'm deeply, deeply freaked out about Trump, 
and about Brexit. I'm not about Brexit itself, but what that means for the logic of how people are thinking. And those in power are going to use divide and rule to keep control. They absolutely have always done it, and they're going to do it. And when you see elements of xenophobia in different countries and so on, you need to actually understand that the people who are exhibiting xenophobic sentiments are also victims. And unless we in the progressive community can actually see the humanity of the people that have reached that point and understand it and do the hard work of trying to pull them closer to us, we don't stand a chance. So now we go to Greece, to Pavlos Jokiadis. He asks, do we need youth to lead the world or rather encounter biodiversity as a living companion to escape the Anthropocene? I think I did answer this to say that absolutely I'm of the view that young people need to lead now, that we have to open spaces for fresh ideas, new thinking, and so on. We as a generation, I'm talking, okay, I'm 52 and I'll say 52 and older. We need to recognize that we've screwed up badly, right? We've, we've been complicit in, in, in where we've actually landed and that in fact, the best thing we can do is actually create opportunities for new thinking, new leadership and so on to emerge. And I would say to young people, do not put your faith in the current bunch of adult leaders because you will be banking on the biggest bunch of losers ever to walk the planet. <laughs> no, I say that seriously. I say that seriously. I say that seriously because we now have the knowledge of the reality of climate change. Had we not had it, you can cut them some slack, right? But now that we know, you don't know only because it's in your interest not to know. Or you are suppressing what you're seeing as Donald Trump is doing because it serves the interests of the people that delivered them to power. And then Colin from England, oh dear. I worked for Greenpeace in the early 80s. We were utopians. What should the organization be doing now? Are you allowed to answer that? Sorry? <laughs> Are you allowed to answer that as an ex? Oh. <laughs> no, I, let me answer it for NGOs, international NGOs, the branded NGOs. You know, Amnesty, Greenpeace, Oxfam, Save the Children, ActionAid, World Vision, K International, Plan, all of these and many more. My message to them right now has to be to look at the contradictions of power that exist within your own organizations. You know, if you are today still spending 60% of your budget in the developed world versus, you know, defending one forest in Europe, which is not going to make a huge impact in terms of capturing carbon and putting a little bit of resources in the Amazon and Congo Basin and uh, Sumatran forests in Indonesia, don't make sense. And I can, you know, give you example after the example. So my answer to you, Colin, if you're listening, is that I think Greenpeace was never utopian, right? It's just that the world was so behind Greenpeace when Greenpeace took the positions that it did. No, seriously. It, Greenpeace was ahead of its time on many, many issues, as have been many other NGOs in different sectors. But I would say today the biggest challenge facing the civil society broadly is how do we mount more united ways of resisting how do we broaden what I call the people's camp? That means that even though those of us are feminists, for example, who have disagreements with religious leadership on their role to play in sustaining patriarchy, we should not use that as a reason not to, not to explore the possibility whether we can work with them on a range of different issues. So those of you who have not read the Pope's encyclical, right? I really invite you to read it because that's probably one of the most radical economic documents to, to, to come out. So we might not get the Pope to do everything that we want on reproductive rights and so on, but if we can find a alliance around some substantive things that move us forward, we must have the courage to do that. And what civil society needs to get better at is to focus on the larger number of things that unites us and to respectfully disagree on the smaller number of things where we are 
divided and to create the space for respectful conversations around difference. That is critically, I think, you know, what we need to do. And I would say to Greenpeace, what Greenpeace has given to the world, which I think is really important, is spunk. You know, you know it's like Greenpeace was never trying to adjust, right? And I think that's one thing we can take. We need more people who are not willing to adjust to the status quo. And I will end on a positive note, if I can go back to Martin Luther King. So in a longer version of that speech that he gave, he called for the setting up of a new international organization. So I was four months old when he gave that speech. And he said, I now call upon decent men and women around the world to come together to set up a new international organization, which should be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> and the good news is, first time I'm saying it publicly, I've joined up with a few like-minded souls, and we are about to launch publicly soon a new institute called VUCA, which means wake up in various Southern African languages. It's called VUCA, the Institute for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> and we need to celebrate the fact, we have to celebrate the fact that we are not adjusted to an abnormal, unjust, unsustainable, corrupt system. And we should take pride in not being well adjusted to injustice. Thank you very, very much. Two things in closing. One is some um, housekeeping for tomorrow. Um, so at 8.30, um, your and our conference, Poet and Residence, will start the process. So in the spirit of null adjustment, I think that's probably a good place to start your day tomorrow. So, so be here for that. And then the final word, um, Kumi, thanks, for a masterclass in both leadership, communicating truthfully, um, challenging, and my appreciation to you and others' appreciation to you as well. Thank you. Thank you.